part of the Nevis Islands Administration's thrust towards openness and accountability. This morning press conference will be conducted as follows. The Premier will first give updates from the different ministries within the Nevis Island administrations. Members of the press corps will be given the opportunity to ask questions. In so doing, you are kindly asked to give your name and the organization or agency that you represent. Just in case, we have to follow up with further information after the press conference. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming to the podium the Honorable Premier of Nevis, Mark E.G. Brantley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to members of the press who are here and those, of course, who are tuned in via the various media houses. I have quite a bit of information to pass on this morning, and so uh, let me get right to it. Uh, I would want to start by congratulating Mr. Digel Myers and Jablin Taylor, both of the Bath United football team. They have been selected to join the Sinkis Nevis senior men's national football team for the CONCACAF tournament, and I extend my deepest congratulations to them, two constituents from the Bath United football team. Let me also congratulate another constituent, Keswin Archibald. He has made the Cricket West Indies President 11 team to play against England next week. Keswin, or Kezi, as we all know him, is of course a very talented cricketer from the village of Brown Hill, and we wish him all the very best as well. Let me segue quickly to extend the deepest condolences on behalf of the government and the Nevis Island administration to the family of Chesley Pharaoh Davis. He was one of Nevis's foremost uh, cultural historians, an MC and sports announcer who was very well known to all of us. Chesley would have passed recently. Let me also extend the uh, deepest condolences to the family of Miss Nyan Farrell. Miss Farrell, of course, hails from Jessup's village and was a senior foreign service officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we extend to her family our deepest condolences. And let me lastly extend deepest condolences to the family of Mr. Jerome Pinney. Mr. Pinney is a well-known name. He was a stalwart in the water sector here. He worked with the Nevis Water Department from 2008 to 2018. His association with Nevis was large in the field of water drilling and he was able to clean, drill, and develop a number of water wells on the island of Nevis. A contingent from the Nevis Water Department will be traveling to St. Kitts on the Thursday, the 24th February, to attend his funeral and to show last respects. Our prayers are with the families of all of those who mourn and all who have lost loved ones. Let me spend a moment to tell you what we've been doing in terms of public works. We have continued the construction on the welding and body repair shop at the government garage. That is now almost complete. We have continued the construction on the Butler's Road, a major road project that we are undertaking. And over the next five to six weeks, retaining wall construction will continue along the main village carriageway. Property wall reconstruction as part of the Bath Village Road Rehabilitation Project will start in two weeks. The department has already excavated and based off the Low Bath Road from Vaughan Radio to Spotlight Disco. This road will be used as an alternative route during construction of the main Upper Bath Road and the condition of this road will needed to be improved to facilitate any detours. Let me publicly say to the youth in Bath that there will be some available jobs on this project and we are hopeful that they will avail themselves of the opportunity to find work right in their village. Let me also say to the contractors in Bath that there will be work available on the walls and other work that needs to be done there consistent with this government's approach that where we are doing projects in communities that members of those communities are, we hope, the ones to be the primary beneficiaries. And so if you're listening and you're from Bath Village, we are looking for workers to be on this project. And if you're a contractor in Bath Village, we're looking for contractors to be on this project as well. And you'll be hearing more from me because I intend to come to Bath and to have the necessary conversations over there. The roadwork adjacent to the Charleston Methodist Church property has resumed. 
The old church stone wall has been demolished and it will be rebuilt in similar fashion, set back a little further into the property. I would want to say a word on that because I know there was some level of controversy about this wall which was an historic wall. The difficulty, however, was that we could not do any improvements in the area because even the movement, I'm told, of the heavy equipment caused the wall to crumble. So the wall was an ancient wall. It would have been good if we could have preserved it, but we had no way to do that because even the movement of heavy equipment along the carriageway caused the wall to crumble and to fall apart. So we have removed it, and the hope would be to try to reconstruct it at a distance that is farther in to the existing property. Public Works has also undertaken construction of a culvert in the church ground area, close to the clerk's residence, bringing some much needed relief to the residents there of church ground. Works there will include installation of a pipe culvert, construction of concrete wing walls on the eastern side, construction of concrete retaining walls on the western side, and a widening and realignment of the road corridor along that section. We are also constructing an access road for fire tenders at the Vance Amory Airport. This access road is critical for the St. Kitts and Nevis Fire and Rescue Emergency Response Officers stationed currently at the rental facility there. We are also in the process of milling and resurfacing the middle and western play courts at the netball complex. In fact, the netball complex is undergoing a massive restoration and renovation at the moment where all the courts will be redone and the facility will be brought up to speed with new lighting and new arrangements. We are in effect creating a brand new netball complex and that work is ongoing at the moment. Work also continues by the contractor Lefko. On the concrete road from the Prospect Power Station to Lefko Yard, those works are now about 90% complete and we expect substantial completion shortly. We have also been undertaking significant work to upgrade a fuel storage and dispensing at the government repair shop, and that is due to recommence this week. Works shall include the removal of the old fuel storage tanks and installation of new storage tanks, installation of a new pump dispenser with new electrical pump and piping systems, and also the reconfiguration of the fuel dispensing area with the construction of a new metal overhead canopy. The works will be undertaken by Sol in conjunction with LEFCO functioning as their contractor. We also would like to report, and I'm pleased to report, that we have recently milled and paved the parking lot at the Alexandra Hospital so that we have a brand new parking lot there. And I thank the men and women at Public Works for their continued work in that particular area and around the island more generally. Let me pivot to health. We have had, unfortunately, attempts in recent times to make health a political issue. And it is unfortunate because health is critical to all of us. And as I always say, we do not know for whom the bell will toll next. We do not know who will require health care next. And any of us in this room and any one of us listening who requires health care, our first port of call is our health care facilities here. Our health centers and, of course, our lone hospital, the Alexandra Hospital. Is the health care system in Nevis perfect? Absolutely not. But the health care system nowhere in the world can be seen as perfect. We understand even in countries with vast resources that there are issues with health care, health care costs, health care delivery. And therefore, we expect that these will be ongoing issues that we'll have to grapple with. I resist any efforts to politicize the healthcare system on the island of Nevis because I think ultimately it is unhelpful. The Ministry of Health and Gender Affairs, we are delighted to welcome registered nurses Maria Rogas and Ma Mary Antonio who are joining us at Alexandra Hospital. Both have been recruited from the Philippines. One is an expert in intensive care and the other in emergency care. Both together have over 20 years nursing experience. In terms of the CT scan machine that we all expect, I'm told it will be 100 
and a 28 slice CT scan. And I'm advised that when, it's, when it arrives, it will be the only one of its kind in the subregion. That we have others which have 28 slice and 64 slice, but this apparently is far more sophisticated. It's a Philips machine. I would have hitherto reported that we expect that this machine will be here in the early part of this year. They have advised that there are some delays, but we are hoping for delivery sometime in May. I am happy to report that the Philips technicians were here. They did a site visit, and they're quite pleased with the site, and we'll be visiting again soon as we try to conclude the pre preparation. I should also last a few years, and certainly as Premier of Nevis, I have presided over a cabinet that has invested significantly in healthcare. I would wish to commend Madam Minister Hazel Brandy, who has shepherded the healthcare sector over a most difficult period the last four years, particularly, of course, as two of those years we had a major health crisis in the COVID-19 pandemic. Over that time at our hospital, we've acquired some very much needed equipment. I've spoken about the CT scan, which is on its way. We've also acquired a portable digital ultrasound machine. We've acquired ventilators. I would tell you that we now have nine ventilators. This is up from two that we normally had. We now have nine. And in fact, those ventilators were pressed into use quite recently in saving lives at our hospital. We have purchased a chemistry analyzer, a hematology analyzer. We have baby warmers, vital sign monitors, hospital beds, and of course, two brand new ambulances have also been acquired. In public health, in the dental unit, we have two portable dental x-ray machines. We have purchased a thermal fog machine to deal with mosquitoes in the community. We have purchased vaccination refrigerators, examination couches, examination tables, Generators, which is important. We have purchased generators with automatic switches for four of our health centers to ensure that those health centers have a continuous supply of power. And for our eye clinic, we've purchased the ASCAN ultrasound machine, a tonometer, which apparently is used to treat glaucoma, and a laser ophthalmoscope, all of which have been acquired to better equip our healthcare providers. In terms of employment of specialists, I am pleased to say that we have three physical therapists that we have recruited, two from the Philippines and one from Cuba. We have recruited three specialist doctors, one internist, one anesthesiologist, and one OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology, I think. Seven nurses have been recruited, five from the Philippines, one from India, one from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have also hired five local nurses who recently completed at CFBC their bachelor's in nursing and we've hired a radiographer from Cuba. In the context of training, you would have heard me from time to time indicate that in the healthcare sector, we have careers available in nursing. And we continue to encourage our young people to look at nursing as a career choice for them. We provide tremendous assistance for those studying nursing, and it is a field that we encourage young people to enter. Currently, we have two nurses who are in Jamaica doing a master's program, one in theater techniques and one in anesthetist, a nurse anesthetist, so anesthesiology. Both are being assisted, of course, by the Nevis Island Administration financially. We also have two nurses who have recently completed the midwifery course at CFBC, and we have three that entered that course in 2022. All nurses who go there through the HR or Ministry of Health are provided with a stipend. For those who are employed currently as nurses and go off for greater specialization, I'm advised that they get four-fifths salary plus a stipend of $300 per month. And for those who are not yet employed to the government but have decided to do nursing, they get a stipend of $1,260 per month. And that is what we have been offering um, for our young people going off to nursing in St. Kitts. Let me add that at the CFBC. In terms of buildings and infrastructure, we have renovated and upgraded all of our health centers. We have improved security at the Flamboyant Home. We have built now a nursing a kitchen at the Flamboyant Home. We are also finishing now the main kitchen project for the hospital, a really 
uh, extended and beautiful kitchen facility to service the entire hospital. We have upgraded our morgue facility to allow the authorities here now to do autopsies there. We have changed our gatehouse at the Alexander Hospital to a respiratory clinic. We built a double port garage, obviously double, because we have two brand new ambulances and we want to protect them from the weather. And we've improved the private ward area and converted some of it to an isolation ward. As I reported earlier, we have paved the parking lot and of course the hospital expansion project continues apace. In terms of medical assistance, a program that I'm very proud of, as we await the rollout federally of the National Health Insurance Scheme, the Nevis Island Administration recognizes and has recognized for some time that some of our people who need medical care are simply unable to afford it. Many times we have emergencies that develop, let us say an accident that happens on the road, and individuals find themselves needing acute care that is not available locally, sometimes not even available in the region. Many times they have to travel overseas for that care, and they simply do not have the resources and do not have the insurance. Even those who have insurance sometimes, there's a bit of an issue sometimes because a lot of the insurance companies say we will reimburse. That means we will pay you back. But that, of course, requires that you find the money to pay upfront, And only after you're treated, you get a refund or reimbursement. And a lot of people have that issue as well. Well, the NIA is cognizant of that, and so we have, for some time now, certainly under this administration, assisted individuals who require care overseas and are not in a position to access that care because of their financial limitations. We conduct a means test to ensure that persons that we are assisting do need that assistance, and we have capped the individual assistance at US $10,000. Using that cap, we have in 2018 assisted persons to the tune of $622,256.69. In 2019, $589,922.73. In 2020, $289,456.40. In 2021, $459,625.20. And in 2022, thus far, $108,676. Again, a combined total over the last four and a half years or so of just over $2 million that has been spent by the government to assist individuals to access care that wasn't available here, or sometimes even if the care is available here. For example, some kinds of surgery, they have required assistance because they do not have the money to pay. And so we have been there for with our people, and all of these are tangible investments in the health care and the health and well-being of our people. The question was asked on the last occasion. I did not have the answer about how much we have spent on COVID thus far. I now have some numbers. In 2020, we would have spent $945,838.44. And in 2021, we would have spent some $1,298,000. $538.77, and that included salaries and accommodation for the Cubans who were here for 18 months. We purchased medical supplies and equipment. We paid for testing, obviously, and testing supplies, and we did some retrofitting work at Prospect, where we have developed, as you know, a, an isolation wing. Developed it, but hoping that we never need it. Let me switch quickly from health to housing, also an important need of our people. And I would want to commend the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, who has led that particular thrust for the Nevis Island Administration since 2013, and has done so with a plum. He has said to me, and I believe it is worthy of repeating, that the NHLDC, the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation, had in the past in every election cycle being a topic of conversation. It had in the past, in every election cycle, been a topic of conversation because there was always the suggestion of some shenanigans happening at the NHLDC. We well know the ringtone, house and land, that was developed here on the island, supported by documentation of things that would have gone badly awry at the NHLDC. 
He has said to me, and I believe it is true, that you don't hear anybody talking now about the NHLDC. And we take some of these things for granted, but I think that they're important to note. Because when we came to government, we said that we would come to government as a transparent body, a party that was committed to doing the right thing. And I believe that it is something to note that when we hear the critics, and there are many in any democracy, there are many, that they go back sometimes 15 and 20 years to find something to criticize. That they're not talking about the NHLDC anymore because the NHLDC has had rectitude and appropriate behavior restored there. And I think that we ought to note that. That, I believe, warrants a headline. No scandal at the NHLDC in the last eight years. Let me report that lots are being sold at Morgan's estate, $6 per square foot. We have also acquired six acres of land to be divided in modern estate, which I'm told is the Cane Garden area, and we are preparing the subdivision of lands opposite the drag strip for leasing for industrial and commercial use. We have also, uh, let me not say we have, we are also finalizing the purchase of just over 20 acres, I believe it is, I hope I have that number correct. I believe it's closer to 30 acres of land at Ghana's estate, which we also intend to subdivide and make available to our people. Now, you may ask why it is that the Nevis government is purchasing land. And the reason is simple. Like our sisters in Kits, we have had a slightly different history. And on the island of Nevis, people got out of sugar a long time ago. And as a consequence, the people of Nevis have traditionally owned land, owned their own land. And so you'll find that while there are lots of land, and you just want to, I tell people all the time, if you just go by the port at Long Point and you, you go south, you don't meet any houses or anything over there for a very, very long way. You have literally thousands of acres of land that is unoccupied and undeveloped, but is in private hands. St. Kitts, on the other hand, because of the sugar industry that existed over there for some time, and because, of course, Premier Bratcher compulsorily acquired the land, and Prime Minister Simmons would have paid for those lands. The result in St. Kitts is that the majority of lands in St. Kitts are government-owned. It's a fundamentally different makeup as a result of our history. So in Nevis, we have been forced to buy land as a government to then make that land available to our nationals. In fact, the two developments that are currently being undertaken at the instigation of Minister Brand, the area representative for St. Paul's, one at Hamilton and the other at Upper Craddock Road, both were only made possible because we went out and bought land from private individuals to then do housing. It makes it far more expensive an undertaking because naturally we have to purchase the land and then do the housing as opposed to having the land already owned by the government where we can just develop housing. So that has been an issue for us but we have not shied away from our responsibility and we have acquired land as I've indicated at Morden Estate. We've acquired land now at Ghana's Estate. We're finalizing that and you'll hear more about that no doubt as the weeks and months go by. In terms of housing, I am pleased to say that we are in the middle of a housing revolution happening on the island of Nevis. Why do I say that? I say that because for the first time in our history, we have seven housing developments being done at the same time by the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation. Seven housing developments being done at the same time. We have in Cedar View, phase three at Martin's Estate, 33 lots, inclusive of green space. Subdivision is with planning for review. At the Mountain Crest, Ramsbury Estate, Craddock Road, we have 22 lots, including green space. I think you'll see the homes going up there. Chimney Crescent, which is in the low ground, that is just above Cherry Gardens, we have 16 lots. We're going to start construction there very soon. Sugar Mill Residences up in Hamilton, we have 14 lots, and already some homes are being completed up there. University Heights, a development that we're very proud of because we offer the land to university graduates at one EC dollar per square foot. Innovation, never been done before, and we're able to attract 
some young persons to come back and settle here. We had 13 lots. That is ongoing. Bayview, which is in Rices, there are eight lots. And Nisbet Estate, there are four lots. I won't get into all the details about the cost and the price, but just to encourage our people who might want housing to speak to the good people at the Nevis Housing and Land Development Corporation. Let me pivot to education. And let me say to you that the Ministry of Education is very pleased to announce the resumption of sports for the schools in Nevis. Why is that big news? That's big news because for the last two years, our children have been deprived of any sports because of COVID. And as we now look to the future and hopefully put COVID in our rearview mirror, we are preparing ourselves for sports in Nevis. All sports days, with the exception of those for St. James Primary and the Violet O. Jeffers Nichols Primary, will be held at the Nevis Athletic Stadium, at the Mondo Track, as we say. Why? Because that is a larger space and a space that we can control more easily. Admission, I'm told, for all sports days will be $3 for primary schoolers and $5 for everyone else. And they will be allowed some parking inside the facility for $15 if you want to drive in and park. A limited number of vendors will be allowed to vend on the inside of the facility. Registration for vending will be handled by the individual schools. So put differently, if my alma mater, the Ivor Walters Primary, is having its sports at the Mondo Track, and you want to be a vendor there, you will register with the Ivor Walters School. So I want to make that very clear. And of course, spaces will be limited. All patrons will be required to wear masks and sanitize their hands at the entrance gate. And as usual, because these are child-friendly events, there will be no alcohol sales inside the facility. That has been a standard uh, position now for many years here on the island of Nevis. As a safety measure, stands will be color-coded. That is, if you purchase a red ticket, a matching red band will be placed on you and you go to the red stand. And uh, the idea there is to prevent persons from mixing. If you want to be on the field, on the grounds, then you'll be given, I am told, an orange band, orange band, and you would have no access to the stand. So we're trying to put in place as many safeguards as we can, but recognizing that sport is a critical part of children's development and that we cannot continue to deny them of the ability to engage in sporting activity. The question, of course, that I know everybody will ask, so before the members of the press ask, are we having inter-primary? Um, my answer to that question is yes, we wish to have inter-primary this year. It is a staple of New Vision Life, and it is time that it resumes. Plans are ongoing to see how we can stage into primary this year in a way that is safe and that brings back competition. I know that my alma mater, Ivor Walters, is waiting to take the crown, and so we look forward to inter primary happening this year and restoring that sense of community and that sporting rivalry, friendly rivalry that we've always had here on the island of Nevis. So the Mini Olympics, we certainly hope, will be back in swing, and you'll get more information on that very shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, as I try to get through the, the rest of my information quickly, you know that I have been a very strong proponent of training and education for our people, particularly our young people. And as a consequence, as Minister of Foreign Affairs and as Premier, whenever I've given the opportunity I have sought to get scholarship assistance from varied places across the world. And we have set up at the Ministry of the Department of Human Resources here a scholarship desk, so to speak, where we try to not only advertise available opportunities for training, but assist students in completing the forms and in getting the necessary information. I want to encourage our students again Please to take advantage of these opportunities. I continue to make the case that it is far more sensible for you to take a scholarship and go away and study and come back without a student loan than to force your parents to go to one of the banks and take $100,000 in loans for the same education. 
And I mean that. Because I assure you that I went to some of the best schools in the world, as many of us here would have gone. I can't recall anybody asking me where I get my degree from. If you have a degree, after a while, it's just about doing the work. So if I could get my degree from Taiwan and come back speaking Mandarin, and you would have gone to the United States and got yours from Monroe College or wherever in the US, come back speaking the same English you left here speaking, you come back owing oh, $100,000, I come back free as a bird. We have the same degree. Which one to you makes more sense? And sometimes maybe you got to talk like this so you break it down in the simplest form. Why are people still going to borrow money to study when scholarships banging dog here? And people say, oh, they're too far, that too far. I mean, no, nobody did. I mean, I got no family did. But you're not going there to live, you know. You're going there to study, to learn, and then to come home, to contribute. And I assure you it is better to come home debt-free than to come home saddled with student loans. And so again, I'm encouraging you to apply for scholarships to the University of the Virgin Islands. The deadline is the 31st of March. Azerbaijan is offering us scholarships. You have to be fully vaccinated, but if you're interested in doing bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degrees, your deadline is the 4th of March. We have Taiwan is offering its usual scholarships. Deadline is the 8th of March. We are accepting applications for Ross University. Persons interested in veterinary medicine right in St. Kitts. We are also accepting invitations, application, I'm sorry, for those interested in attending Windsor University of Medicine in St. Kitts. We are accepting applications for the OAS Marconi International University Scholarships. The deadline for those, 15th of April. Nevlek, our electricity company, is accepting applications for the Cedric and Brister Scholarship in Electrical or Mechanical Engineering. The deadline is 16th May. We are also accepting scholarships, well, we are accepting applications for financial assistance and study leave for further studies. That is now from our public servants and from divisions here on the island. Please note that law, medicine, and business studies do not form part of our priority list. Let me say that again. Please note that law, medicine, and business studies do not form part of our priority list. The deadline to receive application is 31st March. Now, you may ask what is that about? It simply means that in addition to all the scholarships that are available, the Nevis Island Administration also provides assistance. And you are asked to apply if you, for example, didn't get one of these scholarships or you've applied and you're waiting for word and you need some assistance from the NIA, we're asking that you apply. We do this each year. But the deadline, please, is the 31st of March. Too many people like to say, I didn't know, I didn't hear. And so they come in April, May, and June when the deadline is already gone and the panel has already selected the individuals. So I'm asking people, the deadline is 31st of March, just more than a month away. Come in, be in your area of study, and indicate that you require assistance and you will be evaluated and assessed, and the committee, that is a standing committee is in place, will advise accordingly the cabinet as to who they would have selected for purposes of assistance to study. So that is in addition to the various scholarships that are available. We have a young lady, Mrs. Shanola Murray Gill, or another young lady, Mrs. Shelley Leibert, both at HR, who will be delighted to help you. They are the model of customer service and professionalism. So please contact either Mrs. Gill or Mrs. Leibert, and they will be delighted to assist you and to make sure that you get proper information, you get every assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, I switch quickly to agriculture just to say the Department of Agriculture, after a two-year hiatus, is proud to announce the resumption of its open day activity, and it's slated for Thursday and Friday, March 24th to 25th, and it will be at the ETW Park. The theme 
fostering economic growth through innovation. And it will be held under the distinguished patronage of a very good man, Mr. John Ford Paris. So we're looking for all of Sinkis Nevis and everybody else to come. I know normally we get people from as far as Tisha and the U.S. Virgin Islands coming for our open day. We are back, and that will happen on the 24th and 25th at the ETW Park, fostering economic growth through innovation. We are also announcing that from March 8th to 10th, 2022, we will be distributing seedlings to backyard farmers for free, F-R-E-E, -E, free. So if you are a backyard farmer and you want seedlings to grow your tomatoes, your peppers, your cabbage, etc., between March 8th and 10th, while supplies last, you can get them for free at the Department of Agriculture as we continue, of course, our thrust for greater food security on the island of Nevis. Two last areas I will cover. Three, I'm sorry, last areas. Uh, to report from our Ministry of Youth that 18 young persons have successfully compute, completed the seventh cycle of the Yes to Success Skills Training and Diversion Program hosted by the Social Services Department. The closing ceremony would have taken place on Thursday, February 3rd at the St. Paul's Anglican School Hall. This year, all 18 were trained in areas of electricity, plumbing, hospitality, and culinary arts. And all 18 were enrolled in internships to gain practical experience and on-the-job training. Kudos to Minister Eric Evelyn and his entire team because they continue to provide alternative pathways to our youth. And this is something I think that people are looking forward to. The Culture Armor Secretariat invites entries to the 2022 Culture Armor 48 Nevis Culture Armor Festival slogan competition. And they also invite and advise that they've opened the registration for the following competitions. The senior pageants, Miss que Culture Queen and Miss Culture Swimwear and Mr. Cool, and Mr. and Miss Talented Youth Pageant, the Junior and Senior Kaiso Contest, the Soka Monarch Contest, the Junior and Senior Culture Street Parades, the Emancipation Juve Troop, and registration forms are available at the Secretariat or online at www.culturamanevis.com. You should get your forms, etc., to the secretary no later than 4 p.m. on the closing date stipulated on each form. So Culture Armor, we are hopeful, is back. As we hope, of course, in St. Kitts, we'll have Music Fest and other much sought-after events back as well. Let me switch quickly to tourism. And we're very, very proud that we have, as I have announced hitherto, appointed Mr. Devon Leibard. Ginger Land as the acting CEO of the Nevis Tourism Authority. He replaces Jadine Yard, who hitherto functioned in that position. We, of course, thank Ms. Yard for her efforts, and we welcome a local division, uh, Mr. Devon Leibold, to the role. Devon has hit the ground running, and he has been in the news in a major way because we have announced that we have the 2022 edition of a Nevis Tourism Ambassador Program. And this program shares stories of Nevis from trusted voices with audiences around the world. The 2022 lineup boasts musical performer and former Spice Girl, Mel B, model and actress, Nikiva Stapleton, award-winning spa and luxury travel influencer, Ava Roxon Street, and Caribbean media expert, Brian Major. Reaching diverse industries and markets, the four ambassadors will impart their favorite Nevis experiences from culture and history to sports, romance, and beyond. Now, just a quick word. Melby has recently been awarded the MBE, member of the British Empire, and she was awarded that for her services to survivors of domestic abuse. Melby started out, as we know, as one of the Spice Girls, popular pop group. She was known as Scary Spice, and she became one of the most recognizable women in the world and one-fifth of the most successful girl group of all time, the Spice Girls, who have sold some over 85 million records. They created the biggest British cultural impact on the globe since the Beatles. Melanie, of course, has gone on to do many things. I'm sure you've seen on the popular TV shows like America's Got Talent, The X Factor, UK, etc. Uh, she is of rich Nivision heritage, her father is from Nevis, while her mother is British. Nikiva Stapleton 
is a proud Nivision, raised in Chicago. That's how she describes herself. She's an actor, dancer, and model. She currently resides in Los Angeles. Her professional pursuit in dance has her across stages like the Metropolitan Opera, to Jubilee in Texas, and on TV performances from the two-day show to America's Got Talent. She has been part of iconic music videos like David Bowie's final project, Black Star, and Beyonce's single Spirit in the film Black is King. She's currently an ensemble member of Hulu's sketch comedy, Sherman's Showcase, and has had roles in BET's American Soul, Spike Lee, Chirac, Black Klansman, and Netflix series. She's got to have it, as well as Marlon Wayans film Naked and NBC's action Marlon. She's also a model, and she has done work with iconic brands such as Balenciaga, Athleta, Nike, Adidas, Fila, Mac, and more. She is passionately Nivision and passionately Caribbean. We have Ava Roxanne Street. She has been called the most influential person in the world on spa travel and is a top authority on luxury travel. Her fans say she's responsible for transforming a regular spa day into a full wellness adventure. She believes that spa wellness travel and unique experiences are not just a luxury, but essential to a healthy body, mind, and spirit. She has been featured in USA Today, Travelocity, Upscale Living Magazine, just to name a few. And lastly, Mr. Brian Major, who is actually on island at the moment. He's a veteran travel journalist, media and content consultant. He's a managing editor, digital guides and publications Caribbean for the New Jersey-based TravelPulse.com. He has an extensive background in travel and cruise industry journalism and public relations. His travel writing and photography have appeared in Afar.com, Condé Nast, Traveler.com, tra TravelAndLeisure.com, and USAToday.com. And Mr. Major's grandma is from St. Kitts. So we have persons who are connected to St. Kitts and Nevis stepping forward as our tourism brand ambassadors. And knowing the Nivision public and knowing the members of the press who come to this press conference, let me say at the outset that they're not being paid that their role as ambassadors is one that they're doing for free. They're doing this because of their love of the island of Nevis, and they wish to help us in promoting the island. And in the case of three of them, Nikiva, Melby, and Brian, their roots clearly are here. In the case of Miss Stritt, she has been selected because she's an influencer insofar as the spa and leisure travel is concerned. Let me end, ladies and gentlemen, by just giving you some stats which I think are interesting. Uh, I always check the movement of the Oali Water Taxi Facility. Why? Because I think it indicates, as it has now become our major entry point into the island of Nevis, what's happening. I would wish to just give the numbers which are total. I have them monthly, but I'll just give the totals. For 2020, we had 66,000. 507 persons using that facility. In 2021, we had 87,192 persons using that facility. And thus far, for 2022, for the month of January, we've had 11,340 persons using the facility. Just to recap, 2020, some 66,507 persons used the facility. We increased that by 31%. By 2021, 87,192 persons use the facility. And so far for January of 2022 already, some 11,340 persons have used the facility. And to put that in context for you, in 2020, before the pandemic, January, 11,332 persons used it. By 2021, when we were in the teeth of the pandemic, that had fallen to 5,888. And now in 2022, as we re-emerge from the pandemic, we are back up to pre-pandemic levels, and we have the highest January number thus far, 11,340. I will leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. I know that I've said a lot, and now invite your questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Good morning. Good morning. Monique, Washington, I think this name is Officer in his paper. I'm starting where you finished. He's speaking about the Oli Pia. When will the second phase of this year be completed? And the cost for PCR testing at the hospital, what will the cost be for that? Now, with the official release of the two, or about two MSR movies, 
Is the island of Nevis or even the local actors entitled to any royalties that will be coming from these movies in years to come? Second question, with the gas prices rising, how far off is Nevis geothermal project? I know you keep saying that you are speaking to the investors and so on and so forth, but what really is the major issue with this project, why it hasn't started as yet? Now, this past week, a friend of mine traveled to St. Martin. She had to catch a boat to St. Kitts and take a taxi to the airport in order to go to a fairly close by island. Now, what is being done to attract regional airlines to Nevis? And with the decrease in the amount of traffic at the Vance Amory International Airport, how is NASPA able to financially keep the operations of the airport going? Now, with the war going on in Russia and Ukraine, in your estimation, what would be the impact of that to the island of Nevis or even to the Federation? You listed a number of projects, on ongoing projects and upcoming projects, and we know that there is an upcoming election. How many of these projects will be completed pre-election? And that's it for now. Okay. Um, you said I listed a number of projects and ongoing projects and projects that will be completed pre-election. I think all of the projects that I mentioned, uh, the Butler's Road, the Bath Road, etc., are intended to be completed this year. The only project that I think will perhaps go beyond this election cycle would be the wing at the hospital. We expect that it will come to substantial completion this year, but naturally in terms of the outfitting, the equipment, etc., we anticipate that that will go into the next year. Um, things like the CT scan machine, which is clearly a major investment, that all will happen by May. As I indicated this year, that is the expected date. Uh, so I anticipate that what we're doing will be completed. Of course, we were elected for a five-year term, and it is, has, has always been our position to work for all five years until we're ready to ring the bell and the people are asked to look at our performance and to determine whether or not it will be returned. The second phase of the Wali project is, as you have rightly pointed out, the reception area at Wali. Um, we are about to embark on that particular phase of it because we have the plans completed. We have the costing completed. It's just a question of selecting a contractor. So we'd anticipate that that would happen quickly, uh, and we want to get that completed as well very shortly. We do not anticipate that that will be a particularly long project because we already have a structure there that we purchased. It is a question now of uh, using the architectural plans to outfit that structure and to make sure that it's fit for purpose. The cost of PCR testing at our hospital, uh, the cost is still being worked out. Um, we would have met yesterday in cabinet. We had a discussion on that. I believe the Honorable Hazel Bandy Williams and her team uh, will come back to us. What I can tell you is that it will not be any more expensive, and we are asking that it be cheaper than what people are currently paying. So if we know for sure it won't be more expensive. We are now working to ensure that it is cheaper than what people are currently paying. And we will have both antigen tests and PCR testing available at the Alexander Hospital. Gas prices, geothermal, you say, what is the major issue? The short answer is money. And that has always been the issue. The project is, is uh, calculated at about $60 million, I think. And the issue has always been the ability to raise that funding. We have had various companies. We have had various engagements. But that has always been the situation. And we are currently in the final stages of discussion with a particular company, which we are hopeful will yield the necessary resources that we need to finally embark on the production phase of this project, bearing in mind that the exploratory phase is already done. The production phase has really been the area where we've had most difficulty. We engage with the, the CDB, the Caribbean Development Bank, for what is referred to as a contingency grant, I think it's called, where they provide some resources for drilling, and if the resource is proven to be viable for purposes of the production wells, then that is converted into a loan, a low interest loan. If not, then it's a grant. And because that's the highest risk part of the project, that is why that has been dealt with in that particular way. I am frustrated, as I'm sure everybody is, at the slow pace, but this has been the nature. It hasn't helped that we've had COVID, which has prevented persons from traveling, etc. But we are now settled. We are now seeking to do our best to move this particular project forward because we understand it has long-term implications for the island of Nevis and the wider federation as well. I'm happy that you linked it to gas prices because just this morning, gas prices already hiked 
price of oil already hiked as a result of this uh, unfortunate development between Russia and Ukraine, which threatens to drag the world into another global conflagration. In fact, I will say to you, Monique, that I am deeply troubled. As foreign ministers think it's a nevis, uh, we are currently discussing at the CARICOM level a joint statement that we hope to go out today to condemn this type of aggression by Russia. Uh, whatever the reasons may be, we have to respect the global norms and the global world order. It is particularly difficult to understand that the UN Security Council was in meeting when this aggression was launched. As far as I know, Russia is a member of the UN Security Council. And so it begs the question, why convene the Security Council of which you are a member if your plan was to launch an attack at the very time that the Security Council was meeting to address this issue? It shows very scant regard for international law, very scant regard for international organizations, and I would urge the parties to act with restraint even at this stage and to pull back from what could lead to another global conflagration. We have had World War I, we've had World War II. They brought no good to this world except death and destruction. And it is sad to see that for no apparent reason, or none reason that I could understand, that we would have this type of aggression and potentially the start of another global conflict. When we view this in the context, Monique, of us now trying to work our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the war that the world has just endured with this killer disease, COVID, it makes it all the more difficult to understand. We are now getting back to some sense of normalcy. We are now seeing, I'm here talking about sports day. Tourists are coming back. We're talking about people using the water taxi pier again. And, you know, the sense is that the island and the country is getting back to some sense of normalcy. People are working again. People are earning again. And then you have now something which is completely artificial, completely, you know, created uh, something that I think could be avoidable if we had better diplomacy and greater diplomacy and greater efforts to engage in diplomacy. War, I can never see as being the answer. And as far as I'm aware, Ukraine posed no military threat to Russia or to any of its neighbors. So I have a difficulty understanding why we would have an attack of the nature that has been launched and a threat now of pulling Europe, United States, and others into this conflict. So I am very concerned about it. I think that we have almost immediately seen the effects. Higher oil prices mean higher gas prices, higher electricity prices. Higher electricity prices and gas prices mean higher cost of living. That is the reality. And that is why geothermal energy and weeding ourselves of fossil fuel for energy is so important to the island. And that is why, for me, it is so frustrating that we have not yet been able to find a partner that can deliver on the promise of geothermal for us. We will, however, continue to make efforts. We have a team that has been working on this, and we are hopeful that we'll be able to come to terms. We had hoped in December of last year to, find, to sign final documentation with that company, but there were some last minute negotiating points on which we could not agree. And as a result, I and my position is I prefer to have no deal than to have a bad deal for the people of Nevis. And so we said we'll have to go back look at those numbers again and determine what is the best way forward. Van Samu Airport, what are we doing to attract traffic? An excellent question, uh, Monique. We have done a lot in the past, but the poor people have not decided to use that traffic when we've attracted it. So I sometimes am not even sure how to answer that particular question because the airport has become a, a, a usual beating horse for some. Oh, the airport is dead. But as Minister of Tourism, which I was from 2013 until now, I have brought trade wind aviation to Nevis. I have brought uh, Silver Airways, it's now called, but they used to be called, um, memory, my memory is, is leaving me now, but it used to be called something before it was renamed Silver. That used to come. Um, we brought the, the 
this airline that comes from the Virgin Islands as well, it comes in uh, and in fact at one point was based here. Um, I, I'm thinking something, sun something, but I'm my, 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 my sunshine, that's right, sunshine. Uh, they have come, Transanguilla. We have brought, Winnie was here, and all of them have pulled out, and all of them have pulled out for the same reason. People aren't using them. And I have complained right here from this podium that we have Nevisions who are traveling, who have left Nevis, take the boat, take the taxi to RLB, and take the same Silver Airways. Seaborne, it was called before. Uh, memory is kicking back in. Take the same Seaborne. I have recounted publicly that we used to have a minimum revenue guarantee arrangement with Seaborne at the time. That the plane carried 34 passengers. Once it carried 10 or more, Nevis didn't have to pay anything. 10 or more. And I was on a flight from Sangwang and Seaborne, and I counted 12 people going to Nevis. The plane was going to land in Sinkets and then take off and come Nevis and spend the night in Nevis. And I said, praise be to God, at least for this flight, we will not have to pay anything. And when we landed in Sinkets, four people, a family that was headed to Nevis, get up and start to take up their bags. And I said, we all go in the plane going to Nevis. I said, no, 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 we're coming off down here. And we, somebody can pick us up and we're going to take the boat and come over. And so what should have been 12 people coming to Nevis end up being eight and Nevis had to pay. And so the airlines themselves start to say, listen, yes, we're prepared to come to Nevis. Yes, we're prepared to use Van Samri. But the people are refusing to fly out of Van Samri and refusing to use the facility there. So I don't know what to say. I talk to other people who say it is so seamless at Van Samri. You, you have fewer people, so it's very easy to go to and from there. But people prefer to go to St. Kitts where there are mass people line up for long lines and all that. Pay their departure tax and all that in St. Kitts. Pay the taxi in St. Kitts and fly out to St. Kitts. And then when I ask people, because I've actually asked, they say, oh, um, immigration and customs in St. Kitts is easier. In Nevis, they like, turn up your bag. Sink is there still to go. Easier. And some say, oh, it's a few dollars cheaper if they fly out of sink it. But I have been asking, we had a whole campaign, Monique, that we launched here, where we asked people to fly out of Nevis. I remember we did an ad which was being run on Vaughn Radio because all the airlines were telling us the same thing. Look at Winnie. Winnie was a staple here for years. And Winnie pulled out, and I always credited then Premier. Mr. Parry, because Mr. Parry did what he had to do by subsidizing Winnie to bring them back. Because Winnie had pulled out the Nevis. And as we got in, Winnie continued to have the problem of low loads. And for the, for the life of me, I can't understand it. If you know Winnie and Winnie's traffic, Winnie does sometimes as many as six and seven flights a day from St. Martin to St. Bart's. St. Bart's airport infrastructure is far inferior to that in Nevis. Far inferior. And they're doing seven and sometimes more flights per day to St. Bart's using the 19 seaters. And we can't get one flight to Nevis. So, what is the explanation? It's one thing to say to the government, oh, you must do more. But what are we to do? Because I have the evidence, as I've said, we brought airlines. We brought Tradewind, we brought Seaborne, we brought Sunshine, we brought Transanguilla. And for the life of me, the airlines themselves are saying, we just don't understand why Nivisions are not prepared to use the Van Zandt International Airport. Because absent use, there is no purpose to the facility. So the facility really has gone into decline. And when we look at the numbers, since American Eagle left, the numbers have dropped dramatically. I think the taste the travel of the traveling public has also changed. A lot of people tell you they prefer to take the jet and they get off in Miami. We were pushing the idea of people traveling to Puerto Rico because from Puerto Rico, I think they had uh, uh, traffic from Puerto Rico to 26 destinations in the U.S. So we're saying it's an easy stop. You go to Puerto Rico and from there you go to Orlando, you go to different places in the U.S. You can't do that from St. Kitts. 
So go from Nevis to Puerto Rico, see if that's an option. But people are not prepared to take that option. So if you can help me solve the problem, I think we are prepared to continue to work hard to bring traffic, bring the airline, but getting people to use it now, that's a different story. So I don't know what else the government can do, uh, whether we're going to offer the plane ride for free and see people take it. But at the end of the day, it's a question of Nivision saying, do we want the airport in Nevis to survive? And if we do want it to survive, will we use it? Because that's the only way. It's like telling me, you know, you need to invest more in the hospital, and then we invest, and then nobody uses the hospital. People decide to go elsewhere. So that is the difficulty. Um, there's no issue about closing the airport. You say, how oh, does NASPA pain? But the truth is that is a critical bit of infrastructure. We'll have to have it there, um, and we'll continue to have it there. We are in advanced negotiations now for a major project there, but I'm not yet in a position to say much to the public on that. We're hopeful that we'll be in a position to say something to you soon on that particular issue. I believe I've covered all the points. MSR. MSR and royalties, I don't know. I would think not. I would think that persons, if they are acting, they will get paid, and that would be it, that they get paid. The royalties, as far as I would understand, would go to those who own the movie itself. But again, I may be wrong. I'm not an intellectual property expert. Going back to geothermal, you said that money has always been the issue. Now, let's say that you, the money cannot be raised or it's more difficult to be raised. What happens to the geothermal project then? Will the NIA abandon it? And is there a time frame you are looking at in which money should be raised for this project? Short answer, we will never abandon this project. It is too important and we have to find a way. Uh, we have thus far been unable because those that we have partnered with have been unable. And that has been the real difficulty that we faced. But we have not abandoned that. In terms of timing, I believe that the suggestion is that by April, that was the date because the CDB has a meeting in April this year. So that is the date that we are looking at in terms of the financing to be in place for this project. So I have been very reluctant to engage with the press on this particular matter because I didn't have concrete information. And I think as you rightly pointed out in your earlier question, I keep saying that discussions are ongoing because that's the truth. Discussions have been ongoing. And I thought in December I would have something in my hand that I could come and announce. But regrettably, we parties disagreed on some key aspects of the negotiations. And as I said, I'm not committing Nevis to anything that I think is unfavorable to the island of Nevis, and I made that very clear to the proposed developers. But we are not abandoning it at all. We think it's just too important a project for our future for to, to be abandoned in that way. Good morning, Mr. Premier. Good morning. Elke Hewlett, Department of Information. Um, I would have noticed that from the budget um, discussions in December that the CBI earned over $500 million last year. That's the CBI program of St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, and that was the reason why the federal government would have recorded a significant surplus in the middle of a pandemic. Did Nevis receive any of that windfall or did Nevis just get the same, um, I think it's $3.75 million per month that it would have gotten prior to the pandemic? Also, Mr. Huey would like to, Andre Huey of SKN Newsline asked if, there, if we have any students or nationals in the Ukraine-Russia area um, and do you expect to see a surge in applications from Russia for CBI? Um, and will these applications be considered, considering the sanctions passed by the U.S. and other nations against wealthy Russians? Uh, Freedom FM has asked if, says that this month marks two years since locally-based pilots have been grounded because of restrictions put in place to mitigate against the risk of COVID-19. With many countries taking decisions to abandon their restrictions as we speak, Mr. Premier, as the Senior Minister of Health and Minister with Responsibility for Tourism within the NIA, can you tell us about the process to ensure that these pilots are able to resume operations shortly? And that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. You seem like you work at many different media houses. Um, the starting where you left off, the Freedom FM question about locally based pilots, uh, the question is coming to me, but uh, really I don't know that I'm the appropriate authority because the issue in relation to pilots all had to do with the protocols, and that's really managed through the task force. That was the issue, and I think that the issue surrounded when they go in and out 
do they have to quarantine? Are they allowed to just uh, get into the community? I would have thought, I would have thought that now that the quarantine restrictions have been removed, that these issues should fall away. Because the issue, as I understood it, was whenever they landed and had to go to their homes, because they were based here, could they just leave the airport and go home? And of course, we had a quarantine provision in place, which would have been abandoned last year, December. Last year, December, once you're now fully vaxxed, and you come in with a negative PCR test taken within 72 hours, you, there's no requirement of quarantine anymore. So I think that issue went away. So I, I'm not myself understanding what the ongoing issue might be. But as I said, I would not be the authority. Uh, I can, however, undertake to ask some questions of the task force as to what this ongoing issue might be. Um, Ukrainian students, we are not aware that we have any students or any citizens in Ukraine at this point. Um, nobody has reached out, and we are not aware that we have anybody there. Uh, we might, but we don't know, and uh, I'm told that other Caribbean, in fact, I'm on a, a chat with the foreign ministers of CARICOM, and I think so far only Jamaica has said that it has students there. All the other countries are saying they either don't or they're not aware. And so I don't know. Russian applicants for CBI, um, I don't know what will happen there. Um, a lot depends on what happens in the next few days and weeks, whether what we're seeing continues or whether good sense prevails and persons retreat from these hardline positions that they're taking. We will have to watch it and see. I mean, so far as sanctions are concerned, thus far it appears that the sanctions are quite targeted. And so specific named individuals are the ones who are being targeted. So I don't know that it's a, it's, it, it means, therefore, that all Russians are being targeted. It seems to be people who are around President Putin and is in a circle and some of the oligarchs, those seem to be the ones who are being targeted uh, for sanctions. Insofar as the CBI proceeds, that's always a, a, a vexed question for me because you're absolutely correct that in... 2021, when the country and the world was still in the grips of this pandemic, that St. Kitts Nevis had a windfall insofar as CBI was concerned, and we would have earned north of $500 million from CBI. I can say, because it is the fact that Nevis got no more than it always got. And so Nevis got the same amount from the proceeds of CBI in 2019 in 2020, in 2021. And that is $3.75 million per month. It is a matter that I have raised with the Honorable Prime Minister because for me and for the island of Nevis, it is unacceptable. And I've raised that and I've said that this cannot be how the country is going to function going forward. That out of 500, I believe the number is $588 million, Nevis got 45. So you can do the math for yourself. And so my position is, you know, there's a lot of chatter about how much Nevis is getting, and I keep saying that is not the correct question. The correct question is not how much Nevis is getting. The correct question is, does what Nevis get represent a fair allocation of this national resource, which is a CBI industry and the proceeds from CBI? And I'm very firm about that. I say so publicly, I say so privately. I'm very firm about that, that the people of Nevis cannot be shortchanged in terms of a sharing on the CBI program. And when good comes, all the country must share in the good. And when bad comes, we know all the country is going to share in the bad. And especially during COVID, when we were called upon to spend money we didn't have, we were called upon to borrow and beg to survive here on the island of Nevis, I think that it is especially galling that the country had a windfall. And we hear talk about surplus, and we hear talk about you know things are great. But at the end of the day, the island of Nevis got not one penny more than it would have received. And so I have raised that formally, and I don't think that there's anything secret about it. Matters of governance ought to be public because you all put us here. And so I've raised that formally with the Honorable Prime Minister to say that that is unacceptable. And we hope that we will have redress on that very shortly. So thank you for raising that question, and certainly we look forward in the interests of of, of, of good governance, the interest of treating all of our people as if we matter and all of our people as if we are citizens of this country imbued with all the rights and entitled to all the fruits of our citizenship that we engage in a sensible way to resolve these types of thorny issues that have bedeviled us for far too long. 
And so that is my position, and I'm sure it's a position in which the opposition in Nevis will join hands with me, because it really matters not who is in government in Nevis. This issue predated me, this issue has continued, and this is an issue that has to be resolved. And I hope I'm clear in relation to that, because as the Premier of Nevis, I am not going to relent or resign from that position that the people of Nevis must, must get their fair share of benefits from these types of initiatives that are national in nature. I remind us all that when Canada imposed visa restrictions on the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, Canada never said, if you're born in St. Kitts, you have to get a visa, but if you're born in Nevis, you're okay. Canada said, Tut Mun Saman Bagai had to get a visa. I said that to say that when that difficulty arose, the entire country had to bear the burden. Well, if that is the case, how come when the money comes that the entire country doesn't share in it equally and equitably? And if there's any division out there, and anybody living in Nevis who doesn't understand that, and any right-thinking member of the Kiddishan community who doesn't understand that, then I think we have a serious problem. Because to me, that is as clear as day. And I continue to maintain that position, and I will continue to maintain that position. I was of that view. In opposition, I'm of that view in government. The country needs to confront the situation where resources are lopsidedly allocated, and we have to confront the situation where the people of Nevis have access on an equitable basis to the resources that flow into the country from national efforts. I didn't bring my passport with me, but I beg you to check yours. He says St. Christopher and Nevis. That's what he says, St. Christopher and Nevis. It cannot be that Nevis continues to get the crumbs from the table. We have to do better. And that is something that I am adamant about and something that I will not resign from. So thank you very much for the question. Good morning, Devon Cornelius, 1FM. Just a few questions. Agriculture Permanent Secretary Huey Sargent earlier this month reported on talks between, held uh, between him and a lady from the United States in relation to exporting products made by the agro processing unit. Uh, what is the update on that? The Jinjaland Secondary School has received a new wing dedicated for TIVET purposes. What plans does the NIA have for a similar project? at the Charlestown Secondary School. What is the status of the expansion works at the Alexandra Hospital? At this point, what works exactly are happening at the hospital? What is the update on talks between the NIA's legal advisor and developers for one and only resort? And when is the completion date for the Mondo track? And lastly, there are a number of people from Nevis who are receiving or currently receiving dialysis treatment in St. Kitts. Explain in detail what plans the NIA has or have for dialysis treatment for Nevis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, update on agro-processing sales to the U.S., I don't know. Uh, I have not been briefed by Mr. Sargent on those conversations, and certainly I would usually only know once there's something to report, so I would assume that those conversations are ongoing, but I will check with the Ministry of Agriculture, and I would urge you to follow up with Mr. Sargent as well to see where we are. Um, TVET. Uh, the building has now been completed. I believe that we should have an opening ceremony that is being scheduled. Uh, I, I don't have the date, but the building in Gingerland has been completed now. And the project at CSS, uh, in terms of design and all of that, is well advanced. I believe that they're at the stage now of trying to select contractors to undertake that. That will be a much bigger project, the one at CSS. In terms of plans for the TVET Center, I know that they'll be doing various things like cosmetology, um, I know cosmetology for sure, uh, and there are some other areas that they were looking at there. I think uh, technical drawing, 
draftsmanship, I think they call it, or technical drafts persons will be there, uh, and they will be engaged in some technical and vocational training at that facility. So I would expect that we would hear more from the Ministry of Education as we get closer to the opening ceremony for that particular facility. Status of the, the Alexandra Hospital work there is ongoing. As you know, we have two contractors on site. We have um, Evelyn's Construction and I think Wedge Pemberton Construction. Those have been the two uh, contractors that have been with us. We were badly delayed, as we are all aware, because I've said so here during COVID. We were also badly delayed because we had to have some plans done for the interior layout. All of that is now finished and the work has resumed the pace. Uh, the last update I got is that we were at a stage now where windows and the like were being installed, were being ordered, I'm sorry, to be installed. I do not know how far along we are with that. I would assume that that is being done because that was uh, several weeks ago. And so we would expect in short order to see the facade of the building done, to see the windows installed. And what we are now engaging, I'm told, is the interior work. So work like tiling and all of that. Uh, that is being done on the inside of that building. So that is why we're thinking that we will have substantial completion this year, and thereafter we deal with the outfitting of the, the building. Um, let me segue to your last question, because I think it's connected, the issue of dialysis. Uh, you're right, we do have uh, a few patients being dialyzed on St. Kitts, and it is a burden for them because they have to obviously travel back and forth. The NIA has sought to assist insofar as travel is concerned. During the pandemic, for example, when travel was restricted, the NIA rented the boat, chi private charter, to take them over the three times a week that they needed to go over to be dialyzed. Uh, I myself have recently visited the dialysis center in St. Kitts and met and spoke to uh, our our patients who were there being dialyzed and get a sense from them directly because what I find is there's a lot of chatter around the issue. It clearly has become a political football, unfortunately. But I like to talk to the people that are actually being impacted, not those who are out there talking, but those who are being impacted. And from my conversations with them, I didn't get a sense that they were not satisfied with the treatment that they were receiving on St. Kitts. Um, they were getting good treatment, they've been well and professionally taken care of over in St. Kitts. And let us remember that prior to this, the people had to go to St. Martin and to Anguilla. They are now going to St. Kitts, which is just next door. That, however, has not meant that we are not committed to providing dialysis treatment on Nevis itself. We have, and in fact, in the new wing, we have a dialysis center that should be part of the new wing at the hospital. So all that we've been doing really is to try to get that bit of infrastructure completed so that we can install all that we have committed to install there, new surgical suites, dialysis center, new imaging center where we will have the CT scan and all of that, and I believe a significant area for rehab and for uh, physiotherapy. Those are the four broad areas that come immediately to mind. We also will have some additional rooms, recovery rooms and the like, and also some stations for rest and relaxation for the nurses and the doctors, etc., which we don't currently have. So we intend and are committed to the provision of dialysis on the island of Nevis, but I want to emphasize that no one who requires dialysis at the moment is being deprived of treatment. And those who cannot afford treatment are being assisted by my government to access that treatment. And so I want to make that very clear. Dialysis is a very complicated matter. I have heard some people take to the airways to say, just plug in the machine. If you just plug in the machine, people will die. It's as simple as that. It is not a matter that is a very simple matter. In fact, when I traveled to Taiwan some years ago, they took us on a tour of a dialysis facility there, and I was able to see the complexities of dialysis up close. You have, for example, to have people who can treat the water. It may sound simple, but if the water treatment isn't right, people die. You have to have people who can fix the machines and make sure that the machines are in working order. Why? Because if somebody's being dialyzed and the machine ought to break down, you have to have the technicians there who could handle that. You have to have specially trained nurses, which we have done, by the way, because we have exposed our nurses to training. As a matter of fact, recently, there was a nurse shortage at the center in St. Kitts, and there were discussions about our nurses going over to assist. 
at the end of the day, I don't think it happened because I think it was a COVID-related and those nurses were able to come back on board. But we have nurses that we've trained to administer and deal with dialysis. There's also, of course, the specialist doctors that are required. There's a nephrologist that is an expert in blood. That person has to be there. St. Kitts has a nephrologist. We do not have one in Nevis at the moment. But most importantly, there's somebody called a vascular surgeon. And that vascular surgeon is the person who puts the shunts either in the neck or in the arm to allow the machine to be hooked up to do the dialysis. And currently, Sinkis doesn't have a vascular surgeon either. So patients are having to go overseas. In fact, one young man, I believe, is currently from Nevis, is currently in Trinidad, where he had to go to get that particular procedure done. We have another young man from Nevis whom the government has just approved funding for, who I believe will be going to Colombia to get that process done because after a while the shunts start to deteriorate and you have to replace them. I say all that to say that this issue in my view is a complicated issue. It is not one that ought to be treated in a cavalier fashion because we don't have dialysis machines hooked up and operational yet in Nevis doesn't mean that the government has not been taking care of patients requiring dialysis and what we have continued to say to our patients, please we are willing to contribute to taking care of you if you do get end-stage renal failure. But we are praying and hoping through the work of the Health Promotion Unit that you do not allow yourself to get there. That some of the things we're doing and promoting, checking and making sure that your health is in order, watching what you eat, doing your exercises, etc., that we can take care of each other in that way. And we adhere to the old adage of an ounce of prevention being better than a pound of cure. So when we people get there, we're prepared to help, but we are hoping that people will not get there because they'll heed all the warnings and heed all the invitations that they continue to get from the government to do their part and to be a part of what we're trying to do to have a healthier society. So I, I segue to that because that's part of the hospital expansion project. Um, uh, update on the talks with one and only. I don't have an update, regrettably, to give you because those discussions are ongoing. Let me just be clear that the discussions are not with the one and only. The discussions are with the developer. The one and only is only a brand that the developer says he would like to get to manage. It's like the Four Seasons came in and managed the Four Seasons Resort, but the Four Seasons was not the developer. The Mondo track, you asked, well, when the Mondo track be finished, I am proud to say that the Mondo track has been finished for a long time. And perhaps what you wanted to ask is when the second phase, which is the stadium, will be done. And we have no plans to have that done this year because the resources aren't there to have that done this year. And so our focus has been on other things, putting those resources, for example, into the hospital wing and ensuring that we can get some of those done quickly, putting resources into the, the um, uh, second phase at the uh, water taxi facility to get those up and running quickly. So there is currently no plan on the books to have the second phase, which is the stadium at the Mondo Track, done this year. We have added uh, seating over there. We have added bathroom facilities over there. And in our view, what is most important was the first phase of the project where we laid a first-class track for our student athletes and our athletes in general and our people, because so many people use that facility now for exercise early in the mornings, late at evenings. And of course, we have now seen the advent of football being played because the pitch in the middle was designed to accommodate football. So we have a FIFA uh, certified pitch in the middle. We have uh, IWAF certified track. And that for us is what we were seeking to do to move our young people from running on grass at the ETW park. And if it was uh, a hot summer with no rain, they were running on dirt at the ETW Park, to move them from that, to move them to running on a first-class facility at the Mondo Track. So um, just to correct it, that the Mondo Track has been finished for some years, what we now need to add is a stadium, and that is the next phase, and we will get to that when the resources permit. Uh, good morning, Mr. Premier, German Abel, Askin Vibes. Uh, I have a couple of questions in this first round. Um, so the first round? Yes. <laughs> ah. um, first question has to do... Um, yeah, 
first question has to do specifically with the fact that there's always been talk time and time again that we are giving people the opportunity to fish and learn and, and, and build for, and fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but with COVID-19 and the, the ripple effect that it had on both economies and everywhere around the world, and we're seeing food prices and everything increasing, from the government's perspective, is there any idea or interest in maybe increasing the salaries of public servants uh, maybe by a percentage rather than doing the one-off 13 month quote-unquote salary um, for public servants. My second question has to do with criticisms you and the, your representatives would have been um, in the federal government uh, would have been coming in for. Um, for example, there's quote-unquote claims of hypocrisy from um, the CCM members in the government that one, you have two pieces of legislation that were passed but they're not fully operationalized in the sense of the integrity in public life and the freedom of information and then um, your representatives have also been silent on the allegations against uh, a, a sitting member of your, of your cabinet. How would you respond to those criticisms being leveled against you and your representatives? Um, within the federal government. And for now, my final question has to do with the one that you left, well, you, you slightly address, and that has to do with the sport facilities. Um, is there any plans to upgrade the other f sports facilities um, outside of the Mondo Tri? I mean, because we're looking at sports tourism as an avenue to rebound St. Kitts and Nevis' economy, maybe a tennis facility, cricket, um, cricket and basketball and other such facilities. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abel. Um, increasing salaries of public servants, uh, I do believe that there, this is a matter that is being looked at. Uh, I think that there is a committee at the federal level that has been engaged in looking at this. I do not have an update for you at this point, but I can assure you I can get one for you. It is something that we have been looking at for a while. It perhaps would have happened already were not for COVID and the difficulties that clearly the economy was experiencing during that period. But it is something that we have been looking at, and I would anticipate would come and stream fairly quickly. You say the CCM has been subject of criticisms. I confess I must not be in the same uh, spaces as you, because I haven't heard the CCM being involved in any of this. And I hope you're not saying that to preface your question, to make it sound like it's a buzz out there. You actually heard something? OK, I, I accept that you heard something then that we haven't operationalized IPL and freedom of information. The fact is that we have been operationalized and working with the IPL in Nevis now for the past three, four years. I have filed my, um, my list of assets and liabilities to the Integrity Commission in Nevis now for at least three years. Oh, so you, 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 you want to to attack CCM for what is not being done at the federal level, but not tell us what we're doing at the island level. That's what you're saying. Well, I just wanted, I didn't quite understand the question. At the island level, the Nevis Island Administration has operationalized, led by the CCM, has operationalized IPL now for the past three years. We had the Integrity Commission, the offices of upstairs Rams complex. They have been functional. We have been filing. We have had several meetings with them. They've had several sensitization seminars. Uh, I think that that has been going fairly well. In fact, this year, uh, we discussed with them their budget, and I think all of that was sorted out for them. Freedom of information, on that one, I'll take some criticism because we have passed the legislation but not yet operationalized it. It was one of the commitments that we made. It is still something that we are committed to, but again, we were sidetracked by COVID, and we had to deal with the exigencies created by the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the reason why we have not advanced that in Nevis. I would think at the federal level, based on the discussions that I've been privy to there, that there's also the intention to activate these bits of legislation there. In fact, I know that in St. Kitts, we have already appointed an integrity commission, headed, I believe, by a former judge, uh, her former justice, Madam Justice Perletta Lanz. So the infrastructure is in place. It's just a question now of deciding when do we start the filings 
and when they were required. There was also some cleaning up of the legislation that they wanted to, to ensure that it aligned perfectly with what we were doing on Nevis uh, to ensure that you, know, you didn't have one set of requirements over there and one, a different set of requirements over here. So I have no doubt of the commitment of the federal government to ensure that IPL and freedom of information become realities in terms of uh, actually functional bits of legislation on the ground. And here in Nevis, I renew my commitment to get the freedom of information activated. I think that we have kept our commitment to have IPL uh, functional, and it is fully functional for the past three years. It's, it's functioning so good that people don't even remember that we never had it before. Um, allegations against a member of cabinet, I'm not so sure what the allegations are. What I will say is members of cabinet are routinely subject to allegations. I hear that I have done things that I'm not aware of. I hear that I go to places that I'm not aware of. And so I don't respond to allegations because it makes no sense. My personal mantra is to ignore the noise, and I try my best to ignore it. So if there's something of substance involving the government, impacting the work of the government, then certainly it is something I think that we should have a view on. But if there are allegations involving an individual which may, not, may or may not impact his or her uh, ministerial duties, then I don't think that's for me or for colleagues in CCM to get involved in. Um, I think a lot of times we're baited. People want confusion. They want a little melee. So they ask, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? My view is that, what the song say? This, uh, drink your water and mind your business. That's a very good song. No. Um, sporting facilities and upgrades. The truth is that we have been upgrading sporting facilities all across the island. Uh, Mr. Abel, if you were to go to the VOGN, VOGN sporting field, it is really a first class uh, facility. If you go to the sporting field in Brown Hill, now it is one of the best on the island. I'm quite proud of the work that has been done there. If you go to Zion, there's considerable work that has been done there. If you go to nearly all of the basketball courts around the island, they've all been resurfaced and upgraded. The one in Bath, the one in Church Ground, the one in Cherry Garden, the one over there at, at VOJN, I believe just by the school. Uh, we've done the one in Cotton Ground, the one in Jessup's. So we have been on an ongoing effort at upgrading sporting facilities. So that's not something new. That's been something that's been going on for some time. And of course, I just reported just this morning that we're currently at the netball complex uh, where we're upgrading that facility and creating almost a brand new facility there. We have also reported that all the facilities in Nevis will be retrofitted with lights and those that never had lights before are now going to have lights. So for example, if you were to go up to hard times where the community there plays cricket and all that on that field, that field is going to be lit. The Zion field that was not lit before is going to be lit. And then the other fields around the island will have the lights uh, um, changed to LED lights so that we could have a more energy efficient and a safer environment for the overall preservation of the Nevis environment. So, Mr. Abel, you need to spend a little more time in Nevis and, and drive around, and so you'll see what we're doing uh, on the island. And take some photos, please, and, and give me a nice headline that sporting facilities in Nevis are getting serious attention and that is not something new. That is something that has been going on now for some time. I'm very proud of the work that Honorable Eric Evelyn and his team have been doing. Or oh, we've also refurbished the courts up at, up at um, hard times as well. Rollins, uh, just above Crony's house there. Uh, you know, tell me when you're coming over. I, I'll get somebody to give you a tour. All right? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Mr. Premier, Jarvis yes. Brown, Von Radio. Just a couple of questions, sir. Uh, in light of the fact you would have spoken about uh, nursing earlier and uh, you would have touched on uh, stipends, etc. Yes. And, of course, we know during the COVID-19 pandemic, you, the government would have regularized nurses' salaries, etc. Uh, in that regard, the simple question is that what more can be done to encourage more persons into this nursing profession? Because, you know, as is the case with Sink, it's Nevis also has a shortage of nurses. So that's the first question. The second question is that in terms of the, the MUA University in Nevis, um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, that university would have seen students uh, going, back to a, going back to their homeland, so to speak. And of course, while they were here, before the COVID-19 pandemic, they would have um, contributed to local entrepreneurs, etc., they would have uh, 
persons would have leased vehicles, persons would have eaten at restaurants, eaten at restaurants, etc. So the question is that what what is the government or even the university doing to sort of get back those students physically on the island? And those are my questions. Okay. Uh, excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the MUA question, I think, is, is really uh, such an important question. Uh, we have seen in St. Kitts that the Ross students have come back, and we now see the activity all along this trip and in Frigate Bay as a result. You're absolutely right. These are uh, tourists who are here for nine, ten months out of the year, and so their contribution is immense. They rent places, they rent cars, they eat out, as you say, they go to the supermarkets, they consume, etc. Um, so it is absolutely critical that we get the MUA students back. I'm told that they've started to come back. Um, I have been in constant communication with the owners of MUA to determine who, if they can increase the pace of the students coming back because they're coming back in a trickle. We want to see them come back in a flood. Uh, so that is where we are. I think the last time I checked, uh, we had less than 100 students had returned. Uh, we normally would have, I think, about 400 students here. Part of the problem, it appears, is that students have grown accustomed to being able to do their studies online. And uh, because they can do it online, uh, that's what they did during the pandemic. That has become sort of the new normal. And so they're asking the question, well, why should I travel and incur all that when I could stay home in my, in my room in my mother and father house and do my medical degree? There is, I think, very little that the government can do by way of incentivizing them to come. I'm aware that some of the universities, because I've not looked just at MUA, looked at others. Ross, for example, well, Ross is big enough and wealthy enough. Ross organized charter jets, flew them in, um, you know, 100 plus at a time into RLB. Uh, other schools, I'm told, are offering things like free airfare. They're offering to pay their rent for them here. Um, just to get them to come back. So there's a lot that's going on in that, in that space. And from what I gather, there is also fierce competition among the schools for students. So what is happening is as one says, well, I'll offer you a free flight. Another one says, well, I'll pay your rent. You know, another one says, well, I, I could tailor make something for you so that you could do it online. You can spend more time online so you don't have to be here. Or you only, instead of coming here for 10 months, maybe you only need to come for two. So the, 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 the COVID has set this thing on its head. Uh, I absolutely agree with you that the best case scenario for Nevis is to have those people back and we continue to work with the owners to see how we can partner to ensure that the students come back and the students are here. Um, Nevis, I think, is safe. Uh, COVID cases are now uh, very, very, very minimal. Uh, and so our vaccination level is an acceptable level. We certainly hit the target set by the WHO. And so my view is that it is time for them to return and it is time for us to have the benefits that would have been envisaged when we entered into this arrangement with MUA. And so I entirely agree with you. I think it is, it is something that has to happen. What more can be done to encourage nurses? Um, I think maybe personal persuasion, families uh, talking to their children, seeing that this is a viable option for them. Uh, it's, it's ironic that in an environment where jobs have become scarce because of COVID and because businesses would have closed or, 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 or cut back because of COVID, that we are begging people to take jobs in nursing. You know, it's, it's one of those ironies because it is, it is a kind of place where you're almost guaranteed a job. Anybody going into nursing here in Nevis, once they're done, they're guaranteed a job at a hospital or in our nursing sector. So imagine that you're guaranteed a job while you're studying, you're assisted financially, and then you have a profession which I think is one of the most noble professions. Uh, all of those things are potentially available to you. So the question is, why aren't people taken up? I will, however, say to you that it is not just a Nevis problem. It is not just a Sinkis Nevis problem. It's a global problem because even countries great like the United States and others have been poaching nurses from Jamaica and from wherever they could find them. Uh, so that's a very real concern. Uh, I am not sure what more we can do because as I said, we are assisting with the training, 
financially. We're guaranteeing them a job when they're done. And we think that it's a noble profession to enter uh, being a nurse. I should say, lastly, that the requirements have also changed. Because it used to be that you got into nursing and you did a kind of, uh, I don't know the proper language, but I'll say internship, and you became a nurse. Now the requirements are that you must have the Bachelor of Nursing, which is a four-year degree program. So that too has been off-putting for some young people who may not see it as if I want to spend four years to get a degree, but that is the new requirement. It is also, I think, um, that the nursing requires certain science-related uh, subjects that some people find is a hurdle that they can't cross either. So we have all of these other niggling concerns about it. But again, I urge young people who are looking for a career, a rewarding career, to look to nursing. Uh, you get assistance with your training, and you get a guaranteed job when you're finished. And so I encourage them to do that. Are there any more questions for me? Good morning. I am a journalist here today representing BHC Media, and you can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Question number one. The extension work at the Alexandra Hospital began five years ago. As a result of poor planning and chaotic construction practices, the hospital is still not completed. The hospital will now have to be redesigned at a cost of five million dollars. Then, of course, it will have to be rebuilt at the cost of 20 million dollars. I see the minister responsible for Charlestown and that project is not here today. So, Mr. Premier, do you take full responsibility for this failed hospital project? Question number two. Ten years ago, your CCM administration ban abandoned new dialysis machines at the hospital. Today, almost ten years after, 19 divisions lost their lives as a result of kidney failure. Do you take responsibility for the deaths of divisions who suffered from kidney failure? Question number three. The Fountain, Mount Lily, Newcastle, and the road leading up from Shaw's Road all the way up, to which is supposed to connect to Fountain, are all in poor condition. I also took note that the minister responsible for all those bad roads in St. James is not here today. So again, Mr. Premier, do you take full responsibility? Will the government fix those bad roads in St. James before the next election? Question number four. I contested the last election without any financial support. In fact, I was unemployed at the time with no income. I did so out of love for country and a desire for development. However, information came, is coming to my desk that you have hired a prospective candidate to be a community advisor in the constituency where she will contest. My question to you is, are you paying a political candidate to campaign and run for office? Is politics in Nevis now about money and winning at all costs? And my final question is, the Sir Simeon Daniel Museum opened a few days ago on Nevis. It's a beautiful facility. Did you get a chance to tour that museum as yet? And um, what are your thoughts on that historic project at Pinnis? Thank you. OK, um, thank you, Mr. Hanley. I start by saying that if you ever fail to make it in journalism, you can make it as a fiction writer. Because you preface your first question with some 
fictitious information about redesign for five million, reconstruction for 20 million. I have no idea where you would have gotten that information or those numbers from because they're simply fabricated. And I, I keep saying that, you know, these press conferences work best when we approach them with some level of seriousness. I don't mind that people want to make a political statement, but at least let it be based on fact so that we could have a factual conversation and not have to waste time dealing with things that are fabricated and that clearly make no sense and advance us not even one inch insofar as the development of the island is concerned. I believe I addressed the hospital project. That question was asked um, by a journalist earlier, and I indicated where we are with that project. The project has been delayed. Twin factors, one, COVID, and two, the fact that we had to do a redesign for the interior. Both of those are done, and the project is proceeding. We expect substantial completion on the project this year. We are engaged now with the internal aspects of the project, and we expect sometime next year to be able to inaugurate a brand new facility for the benefit of the people of Nevis. So I don't know what else I can say. I don't know where your information is coming from other than a figment of your own imagination. And so I would suggest again that that not be a part of this discussion and we leave that for Facebook and for the usual social media uh, shenanigans that we engage in from time to time. Um, you said the Minister for Charleston is not here today. I am not aware that ministers have ever taken part in this press conference. Uh, this press conference is a Premier's press conference, and uh, while ministers prior to COVID would attend, they have never taken any active part. I said the same thing in relation to the representative, the Deputy Premier, who, whom I assume you were alluding to about roads in the St. James area. On the issue of roads, I think that we have done an excellent job seeking to develop the road network across Nevis. Uh, we have engaged in a number of roads all across the island. Hanley's Road, Brown Hill Road, the island main road from Cotton Ground over to Cliff Dwellers. We have done the road in Shaw's Road. We have done um, roads up in Braziers. We have done roads in farms. We have done roads across the length and breadth of the island of Nevis. In fact, we have been criticized, saying that we're doing too many roads. We have been subject to criticism by the same opposition that now makes the claim that there are roads that need to be done. And this schizophrenic approach to politics is really difficult for me to comprehend because it seems like some people are saying one thing, other people are saying something else. On the one hand, you're doing too many roads. That is not development. On the other hand, there are these roads to be done. Short answer, Mr. Hand, is that we are seeking to do the roads as our resources permit. We have currently um, in the discussions to do the rest of the island main road, which would take us from uh, Cliff Dwellers over to Newcastle by the new police station and fire station. Uh, and we are hopeful that we can conclude those discussions and embark on that particular project uh, in short order. We are currently doing Butler's Road, which is in the St. James's area, a commitment that we had made and a road that had not been touched for well over 50 years. So we are seeking to bring development and bring better infrastructure as we go. But I don't know of any country, barring those that have vast resources, that are able to do all the roads that are necessary to be done all at once. It is a process and we will continue to do the roads as we can and as our resources permit. We look at Sinkis, which is far better resource than we are. Sinkis has only now finished the repaving of the island main road. So it is something that is a part of development. It is a process that we have to engage in. But I don't see the need to make this into an issue uh, because I think that there are many people all around Nevis who complain about the condition of their road. But we understand that we must do them as we can. The people of Bath, for example, have waited long. The people of Brownhill waited a long time. So we are getting to the roads, uh, Mr. Handy, as we can, and I assure you that we do not engage in election gimmickry, so we'll continue to roll out our development plans during the five-year term that the people of Nevis have given to us, and we'll continue those development plans in the next five-year term that we're hopeful they will also give to us. You say CCM abandoned brand new dialysis units 10 years ago at the hospital. Again, I'm not sure because I recall that two dialysis units were delivered on the 1st of April 2014. 
if memory serves me correctly, I remember it was April Fool's 2014, that we got two machines delivered that were ordered by the NRP at the time. Machines which, when we looked at them, should have cost roughly $30,000 each. $225,000 was paid for those two machines. We are yet to understand where the rest of the money went, but we understand it was an election season, and we understand that some engage in election gimmickry because there was no plan for dialysis by the NRP. None. No nurse trained, no nephrologist, no vascular surgeon, nobody to treat the water, nothing except two grossly overpriced machines. And one may want to wonder rhetorically where the money gone. Because what should have been 60, 65,000 US, we paid 225,000 US dollars for it. They arrived, perhaps fortuitously, perhaps by some act of faith on April Fool's. Because I believe that's exactly what the NRP had intended, was an April Fool's joke. And so what were we supposed to do with them? Plug them in and kill people? No. We decided that we would be a responsible government. Because if we are to offer dialysis to the people of Nevis, then we must be able to offer a process that was safe, a process that we could stand behind. And with nobody on the island capable of operating those machines, how could we have offered dialysis? And so we have not abandoned our patients. I laid out just now all that we have done in relation to our patients, that our patients are now being dialyzed on our sister island of St. Kitts, which is two miles away. They used to be dialyzed in Anguilla and St. Martin without to take a plane. Now they take a boat that the NIA helps to fund for them to go over and be dialyzed. We talk about 19 people having died. And it's my surprise you, Mr. Hanley, but I am not God. It might surprise you because sometimes when I hear you all talk, I wonder if I'm intended to be God. I am not. I am flesh and bone just like you. So the notion that some of people have died and it's my fault. As if I gave somebody kidney disease. Me. And I make sure that they're dead. I mean, you almost, it is, it is for me sad, really. It is sad that any time there is an untimely death, before we can say condolences to the family, all this palaver start about the government kill somebody, the government this, and people who in my view should have sense, people who should know better and not seek to politicize. We had a young person died the other day, very sad situation. Before anybody could say condolences, I see a, a lady say she's a candidate for NRP. Start to say, oh, that CCN got blood on their hands. Because the water supply is bad and somebody needs to investigate the water, the water killing people. And one of our own had to correct and tell her the same water that people in that area are drinking, they're drinking from Zion, come all the way down. So it can't be the water. And I'm aware that calls were made to that family, asking the family to go on radio. To do what? To politicize the death of their loved one when people are in mourning. We must stop it. We are better than that. And it continues to bother me that we go down this road. Every time somebody has a tragedy, somebody is grieving, oh, if government fault, if government had do this, if government had do that. If you were to tell me that persons would have died because they could not access dialysis, then perhaps you would have an argument. But that is not the case. Because every individual, so far as I'm aware, who has perished because of end-stage renal failure has had access to dialysis and has been dialyzed. So what then is the argument? Is the argument that if they were being dialyzed in Nevis, that God's plan for them would have been different? What is the argument? So these are things to my mind, and I talk about trying to politicize health. We need to cooperate on these things, lend our collective ideas to see how we can advance the healthcare sector on the island. This constant effort to, to, to coop, to see who, who did, to try to find, oh, you said 19. 19 persons have passed. I wonder sometimes if we spare thought for the 19 families left behind. Or are we merely interested in the next headline to say that the government is at fault for people 
having passed. I mean, Mr. Hanley, I know you're asking the question that are politically expedient for you to ask, but I think sometimes we ought to think about these things. Think about how we are trespassing on families' grief to try and invite them to be political about the death of a loved one. Think about these things, because I think that they're important things for us to reflect upon if we are to become a better society. You said you contested the last election without funding, without um, financial support. I thought you were going to say without support at all, because that was my recollection. But anyway, perhaps I digress. So you're concerned about a prospective candidate, you say, being appointed as an advisor. I'm not so sure at the connection. I think if you're referring to Ms. Latoya Jones, she was made an advisor, was it over a year ago? Over a year ago. We have an election which is in the offing, which is due by March of 2023. And if at some point Ms. Jones is selected to be a candidate by the process that the party uses to select candidates, then she's selected to be a candidate. Just as you were selected to be a candidate at some point before you were deselected and then reselected again. So we understand that there's a process. I don't know that this hullabaloo that is you know, people are talking about that I'm paying somebody to campaign. Uh, the advisor is doing her work. She's assigned to advise in community matters across the island. And the fact that she lives in St. Thomas's and is clearly a part of the St. Thomas's community is really the explanation as to why you see her being very visible in that community. It is also the fact, Mr. Handley, that the people of St. Thomas's have been without a cabinet member for a very long time. They've been out of, we've been out of cabinet members since 2013. So clearly, we are trying to know what is going on in that community. I wish I could stand here and tell you that the representative for St. Thomas's regularly comes to me to bring to me the concerns of the people of St. Thomas's, but she doesn't do that. She doesn't do that. The last time I met with her, I invited her to come and meet about vaccines. And that's the last time I met with her. I am not aware of any meeting where the representative has come and said, I have these concerns for my constituents. So, absent that, we thought that it was important to get somebody so that the people of St. Thomas's were critical to the island of Nevis and the development of the island of Nevis. They are not left out. They have someone they could go to and talk to, just as other people in the community do, to say, well, listen, we have this problem or we have that problem. Ms. Jones, for example, has come and she has said, listen, the cotton ground play field is in a dangerous situation out there with the wall. We have since gone and designed, and I can tell you that we are shortly getting the construction of that done because she was able to come and say this is a problem. She has been able to come and say there are certain roads over there that need to be attended to, certain flooding issues that need to be attended to. Where is the area representative? Where is she on Facebook making noise? That is the kind of thing. So, to my mind, you know, maybe I digress, but let me digress. There's a woman in Jamaica called Lisa Hanna, a politician. And I would even be presumptuous to say my friend. And I see Lisa Hanna on her social media. You know what she's doing? With the government representative, she's in opposition, you know, in her constituency up in Ocho Rios in various sites saying, listen, my constituents need this done. My constituents need that done. My That's what representation is about. So where is the representative from St. Thomas's, Mr. Hanley? I don't see her. I don't hear her. So absent her willingness to engage, we have decided that we want somebody who could be able to take the concerns of the persons not only of St. Thomas's but of the other areas and bring them so that we as a cabinet can look at them. And I believe that that is innovative. It is something that should be encouraged rather than discouraged. And so I leave that there. If there are concerns about Ms. Jones being a candidate, well, I believe those concerns should be addressed at such time as she's announced as a candidate. I'm not aware that she's ever been announced as a candidate for any political party. So Simeon Daniel, you said museum was opened. Um, I have, you asked if I've had a tour, the answer is no. I have not been invited to, to have a tour, nor have I gone on my own volition. Um, and so I don't know, I can't speak to the quality that you spoke of. 
I will take your word for it, that it's top quality, but I have not myself been able to, to attend. So I hope I've answered your questions. I believe I've touched them all. Thank you. Any further questions for me? Uh, Mr. Premier, I think I will take up your offer, uh, but I'm looking for, uh, I hope when I come through customs, I, I wouldn't be harassed. When, customs? When I take up your offer. Yes, when you, I come through. Um, you come through customs when you come from Sink. Yeah, anything's possible. <laughs> okay, um, I have two, two quick questions. Um, they, they have to do with the chance, of course. I, I'll start with this. Um, can you address, because the, the, the question may sound a little political, but can you address the strength currently of the Charleston Accord um, in light of the fact that there have been quote unquote a lot of chat, a lot of rumors surrounding that the Prime Minister may be running looking to, to run for a third term. Can you uh, clear the air on that? As well as since uh, on Monday, on Tuesday rather, since the People's Action Movement had their um, press conference, they would have indicated that you would be the feature speaker at the convention next month. Coming out of that, there's still more chances that, hey, maybe CCM and PAM would look to correlate and, and run. Can you clear the air on that and the strength of the chance at this point in time? I clear the air on Mr. Abel? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not so sure. You're asking me to clear the air. PAM has said I would be their feature speaker. It's not the first time that I've spoken at the PAM convention, uh, and I look forward to it. Uh, the, the PAMites have been in unity with us. They are all one family politically, and I see no issue there. Uh, as I said, I've spoken there before, so I don't know why this is newsworthy. Um, the Charleston Accord is strength. I think that some aspects of the Charleston Accord have worked well. Other aspects have not worked as well. One of the aspects I alluded to was the CBI and the sharing. The Charleston Accord said in uncertain terms that it would be shared on a pro-rata population basis. On that basis, Nevis should get roughly 30% or thereabouts of the CBI proceeds. If you do the math and you work out 30% of $588 million, you get a sense that Nevis is nowhere close to what the Charleston Accord mandated. Uh, the Charleston Accord also spoke to issues uh, such as uh, two-term limits and that. And, you know, I, I have heard the chatter myself, Mr. Abel. I can't speak to what the Prime Minister's intentions are, but I will say that I am committed to the principles enunciated in the Charleston Accord because that was the basis on which the CCM entered into this relationship called unity. In fact, the Charleston Accord was signed, if memory serves, right on the courthouse steps in Nevis, in Charleston, by the Honorable Vance Emery, then leader of CCM, the Honorable Sean Richards, then and now still leader of PAM, and the Honorable Timothy Sylvester Harris, still then and still the leader of PLP. So we must ask the question whether those individuals were committed to what they signed or not. I think they are honorable people, so I expect that they will be committed to what they signed. Uh, Mr. Amri is no longer there, but that mantle has been passed to me, and I am certainly committed to the principles outlined in the Charleston Accord. So I can't make it any plainer than that. Any further questions for me? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like that's it. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank you for the questions, for a robust exchange, and I look forward to seeing you at the next press conference, which I hope to be able to host in another month or so. Thank you all very much, and thank you to all who tuned in and all who listened. Thank you.